professionally, I'm a, a working musician for 44 years. It's all I've ever done. I had, I've had a few other jobs when I felt like I needed to get a real job. When my kids were little, I thought, gee, I better get a real job. I better not go on the road anymore. I've tried other things. I just didn't care for them. Hi, Lynn. I'm doing what I was supposed to do. This is what I was meant to do during my life, is play music. I'm a musician because that's what I'm supposed to be. That's what I'm supposed to be. I know that for sure. Uh, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the New Orleans Cafe. Uh, I hope you enjoy the music. All right. In G, a one, two, a three. <coughs> Chris Steele's on guitar, Dick Howell, piano, harmonica, and my buddy Tommy Morgan back on the drum. I've been walking around, baby, I'm gonna play the blues. Oh, you treat me like I'm some kind of fool. I'm gonna play the high class joint. Kind of the the grandfather of uh, of rock and roll in the Northwest, I think. I mean, he really was among the very first people to not be a country artist or a rockabilly artist, but a, a R and B artist that, and white in the Northwest. <laughs> legacy goes deep and far and he's played all the gigs he's played all the all the good gigs and you know all the CD bars all the stories about the Spanish castle or the place Place Pigal or you know he has all of those stories and memories to refer to you know he wrote a book after writing for my newspaper every month he collected those stories and, and published it as a book he was one of the first of the rockers in the area. Some of the other bands got more credit, like the Whalers or the Kingsmen, you know. They got probably more credit than Bill did at the time. You know, Bill was there already. He already was doing that stuff. When he's here, or when we're together, or whatever, he's He's Bill. I mean, he's he's my husband. He's the father of our children, our, a grandpa. Sometimes I'll go to work with him, and and I'll look at him, and that's the professional side of him, and it always amazes me. I mean, I still clap for him because I think he does a great job. <laughs> I got polio when I was 10. And uh, so all of a sudden, um, I couldn't do things that the other kids were doing. Um, couldn't ride a bike, couldn't, you know, play ball. So I needed something else. And music just kind of came, it was almost like music just kind of came in there. We're gonna go up here on what, what they called for a while the hilltop in Tacoma. Glorious hilltop. My mom and dad, originally from Minnesota. My dad bought a house, and that's where I, that's the house I grew up in. So I lived there from the time I was 10 until I was, you know, 19, something like that. My mom and dad really never got along. He lived upstairs, she lived downstairs. They never talked. 
But so the memories of, of this house aren't the happiest memories that, that I have. But it's where I grew up. It's where I first started playing music. I used to sit in my room with this big old guitar that had belonged to my father's grandpa or something. And I'd pretend I was playing music. I don't know, I think he accidentally fell into it. When his first professional job that he got was with some black musicians that, that played in a George Washington Carver Legion Hall. And uh, that was the music they played and uh, Bill's abilities allowed him to play it with them. I was probably about maybe 16 years old. I got up on the stage with my electric guitar. We'd play slow blues and what's called a shuffle. So it was either slow or a shuffle, shuffle bump, ba bump, ba bump, ba bump, or slow blues. That's all we played, except for Danny Boy. We did play Danny Boy. And I knew when to change, I knew when those changes were going to come. I knew when to change from one chord to the next. I don't know. I think it's because I'd learned about country music from my dad's cousin, and it's a real similarity there. I think Bill was the first guy to really start playing the, the black music that we were starting to hear on the radio. And he brought that into uh, white teenage America in the 50s. A friend of mine who was a musician, we were in junior high school, and we saw these other two guys that we went to school with, didn't really know them. So we started talking to these guys. and. There we were, we were talking about getting together, and there were no other bands in the coma at the time, no kid bands. We were the first one. We're sitting there talking about it, and uh, we could do this and we could do that, and we, and we decided to meet the next day after school at my dad's garage, and we did. We met there, and we started playing, and we, I, we must have been just horrible, I don't remember, but when it finally said, somebody said, what do we name our band? and the Blue Notes, you know. So that's how it started, in my dad's garage. It was a horn band, and uh, it was kind of sophisticated. Bill would be up there, a little skinny guy, you know, fronting the band, and, uh, and the horn players would be doing steps, and so would the rhythm section guys, and. Uh, it was pretty cool. I was going to uh, Renton High School and they had these square dances and barn dances and then teen dances as well, so they started having those. And one of the very first ones that I ever went to, Little Bill and the Blue Notes were playing at it. Not too long after the hit, his hit song, you know, uh, came out. And uh, yeah, it, it was amazing because he had a big sax section with him. And... But does she love me? Well, I'll never know. And I'll never be free. Our hit record was, uh, was a complete accident. We didn't... Uh, we lived in Tacoma. We went to Seattle to a studio to, uh, to record ourselves. See what we sounded like. So we recorded all these instrumentals. And when we were all done, uh, we paid, we paid the studio up front. And he came in and said, "You still have time if you'd like to do anything else." And we'd been doing his vocal that I wrote. Lives inside of me. He said, "Well, let's put it down." So we, we recorded it and recorded it live. I sang right along while we were doing it. And he came in the studio and he said, "Who wrote that song?" And I said, "I did." And he says, "Well." Uh, I want you guys to all just hang around for. I'm gonna call somebody. I want to come by and hear hear this song. And he called the people that owned a company called Dalton Records, uh, that were based in Seattle at the time, and uh, they were real players. They had a group called the Fleetwoods, who were already selling millions of records. Can you imagine? I mean, I was the, oh, I was just barely 19, and I was the oldest one in the group, and we were completely blown away with that. We made the national charts. There was a dark side to it. He dealt with having one hit 
by uh, uh, drinking. <laughs> I mean, that was all fun, and I did road shows with different people. I got to work with whoever came to town. I'd always be on a show, Fabian, Brenda Lee, whoever. I went on the road of adventures, Bobby V, and then, you know, then it was over. He was very disappointed that, that he was a star for a minute, and then he wasn't again. It didn't last very long, and uh, it was like I was 19, and I felt like a has-been. One of the things that Bill told me about that, when you think about it, how many people have one hit? He has one more than almost everybody in town. After a certain amount of time and a certain amount of success locally, I think he's gotten over that and he's very content to be who he is and where he is. And I'm sure there were other people just like me that had the one hit. There's thousands of them. And I'm sure they went through the same feelings that I did. You know? But luckily for me, I got out of that. I, got a, I broke through that, you know. I love the angel. Two, three, He's part of the fabric of the Northwest scene. I mean, you don't have a blues scene in Seattle without Little Bill in it. He's not a black guy from the South. He is a white guy from the Northwest. Um, but he has so much soul emanating from him anyway. It's not like you can compare. He is unique to this area. It's just So the music maybe takes on a different spin being from the Northwest or from Little Bill. He definitely can speak to the despair that maybe someone goes through here. And it's not all despair and bad times. The blues is about expressing yourself, good, bad, ugly, and different, whatever the feelings are. So Bill has a way of putting that in layman's terms and putting it into everyday people's language. We leave this city looking great. Okay, well, we're going to talk about the blues, so I need my blues hat. My new blues hat. First of all, somebody says, teach me to sing the blues. I would have no idea how to do that. Uh, because a lot of blues is feeling. Um, there's a story that I've told before. When I was 19 or 20, I met Ray Charles. And, uh, and I went back in the dressing room where he was. And... And uh, he was sitting there, and this fellow introduced me to him. And Ray Charles said to me, he said, are you a musician? And I said, yes, I am. He said, what kind of music do you do? And I said, Bl blues. And, um, and he said, you're white, aren't you? Which, I don't remember my exact feelings, but I, I bet that kind of threw me. And, but yet I said, yes, I am, I'm white. And he said, uh, well, he said, that don't matter, you know, if, if you... Uh, if you believe what you're saying, you believe what you're singing. Think, you know, listen to the words. You got to believe them. So it's about feeling. I do it with as much feeling as I can. And I do try to think of the words, if nothing else, to give respect to the person that wrote them. Because they're stories. They're like country music. They're stories about something. They're someone's story. I'll think of some title and then the next thing I do is I'll try to come up with a chord progression so when I write blues I, I strip pretty much with blues progressions I'll, um, I'll do you one song well let's see the tears keep falling 
And the hurt won't go away I said the tears keep falling And the hurt won't go away Well now it's the same old story It's just another rainy day So that has the blues progression, but I add to that the gospel progression where it goes. So it makes it more gospely. Master at getting jobs. Yeah, he's just unbelievable at that. He's a very good band leader. A band leader's main job is to procure work, and there's nobody better at that. I spend every day, except Saturdays and Sundays, working on my business. And whether that means uh, making new contacts, uh, sending out promo, Booking a job, reestablishing contact, something. I do something every day. I've never been down to Mississippi, but then neither have you. We're going to be there in January and in March. I'm proud of the work that he does, and I don't mean just being up there on the stage as an entertainer, of course, I mean, that's really cool too, but the work that he does at home every day, that, that's getting on the phone, that's getting the jobs, that's doing the promo packages, that's worrying about um, providing work for all the people that he does work with, that's keeping his commitments to people. If I can I'll say, here's my advice. Don't wait for anyone to call you, because they're probably not gonna. You know? I could count on one, on maybe one hand, the calls for me to come and perform that I get in a year. I make the call. I make sure that people know I'm here. Hi, Gene, it's Bill Engelhart. <laughs> Sell a lot of motorcycles today, are you? It's raining out, you know. Not a good day for motorcycles. You're going to do the uh, Taco Thursdays again next year? Can we write them down now? Go.
April 15, May 13, June 10, July 22nd, August, September. Gotcha. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Done. Bill's work is done for the day. A one, two, ba -dum, ba -dum. Mm -hmm. Musicians don't get paid to play, they get paid to unload the truck, set up and load the truck. So I shouldn't be making anything. You think we have a guitar player? But it's sure gonna sound crummy if we don't. Hi. I'm at the cook. We've already played your first two. <laughs> we played the first set already. The thing about it, to do this kind of job, you have to leave your ego at home. As a musician, like, you know, musicians want to, they want to be the center of attention. I, I used to be like, when I was young, I wanted to be like, but then after a while, you just realize you're not always going to be the center of attention. You're a working musician. That means you're, you're playing music to make money. So you can't worry about, it. see, they're not paying any attention to me. So what? You know, somebody is, you know. So we play for ourselves. I said, you ever plan to move the west? Take the highway, that's my way, it's the best. Get your kicks on Route 66. It winds from Chicago to LA. The friendship with Tommy, I mean, I guess Tommy and I have kind of been married to him for <laughs> over 40 years. I would say that, that Tom is the person that is his very best friend. He's one of my very best friends. I've been working with Bill on and off since 1963. Played for several years. You know, Drift in and out, drift in and out. This time we've been together since the mid 80s. Tommy means more to me than the music, if that makes any sense. As much as I love playing music with Tommy, I really like hanging out with Tommy. You know? He's the real deal. Whoa! <laughs> Yeah, Tommy's so steady and so reliable, and just they fit together like hand and glove, which is what you want in a rhythm section. To be able to have the same rhythm section for years is unheard of in most bands, but in Little Bill's band, he's the bass player and Tommy's the drummer, and they've been doing this for decades. You don't necessarily get run over by it. It's not a full-fledged river. It's it's a brook. It's just flowing so that then the melody and the song can develop on top of that. Well, you can get your kicks on Route 6 to 6. The real key to the whole deal is him and Tom together, and then the rest of us play to that. And 
when those guys are on, forget it, you know. It's happening. <laughs> So I haven't really had a lot of other jobs. Um, I was never very good at any of them. I just wasn't, you know. It wasn't me. But when you're young and you have a wife and little kids, you do what you gotta do. Jan's a remarkable lady. Uh, she went through the, the alcohol parts, the drugs, the not coming home sometimes for two or three days at a time. I'm a uh, recovering alcoholic and a uh, recovering drug addict. I was addicted to amphetamines for well over 30 years. Jan has got to be the strongest person I've ever known. She's my hero. The strongest person he knows. I think he's one of the strongest people I know. I guess I just want to spend my life around my family and watch those kids grow up. When I leave the music business, or if I even semi-retire from it, my life is my, is my family, and thank God I have one. 1959, a young man from Tacoma, he put his hit song from Seattle onto the national charts. We're delighted to have him here today. Please give a warm welcome for Little Bill. His song was I Love an Angel, Little Bill Engelhart. Bill is a person who has made a statement about who he is and why he's here. He's used his gift to make people enjoy their lives more through his music. Well, I love an angel Because she loved me Well, I'll never know when the museum opened downtown and they had the opening concert and I played the opening concert, I was in there. I was in a museum. You know, whoever thought that would happen? None of us ever thought that would happen. But I, when I came around that corner and looked at that, it just all made really, it all, it just made sense to me. I thought, this is who I am. That's who I am and that's, that's okay, you know.